great problem of the theatre as a form today is that it speaks so little to people. There are plays that have success, but the form itself can hardly be said to be one that speaks deeply to people in large quantities all over the world. The interesting thing is to find how on a very deep and simple instinctive level there is a common language. The theatre on the whole is in such a bad state and in such a state of confusion today that everyone, however much we're in research, very much wishes solutions to appear. What we're trying to do in this work is to discover what lies behind and what consequently invigorates the different forms. to make a theatre group on a new principle. Instead of making a group of people who share the same background, who share all the elements of common language, not only the words they speak, but the same values, the same class, the same politics, and so on, as you find in any theatre group all over the world, to make a theatre group composed of differences, and pushing that to the extreme, composed of people whose whole, not only their background, but right through to their natural body rhythms, as different as can be, and through these differences find what is deeply common. My name is Helen Lydia Mirren, and I'm from South End on Sea, in Essex, which is in England. I mean, I think the common interest is the fact that there isn't any common interest. It isn't as if we're all together because we want to explore uh, communication without language or we want to find out how to do a theatre with your bodies or... There's, there's no one common interest like that, I don't believe. I came to this group because there was nothing else at that time that I wanted to do in the theatre or in acting. And that was because I was um, very wearied by the theatre in England. I'd been working for four years, non-stop. There seemed to be absolutely no reason in carrying on with that because it wasn't progressing anywhere. The group's work attempted to be more generous than it would be if it was just concentrating on one single thing, like getting a performance right for the evening. We tried within it to go out into the streets and find our relationship with the neighborhood. And yet that was just a portion of it. We also tried to come back inside and in great stillness and concentration find our relation with more subtle and difficult aspects of our work that normally escape us. And then, at the same time, recognize that we have another living obligation in research work to fellow workers, and therefore the meeting and demonstrating what we were doing and exchanging it with other groups, with other professionals, had its place. It's because of this that in our work in Brooklyn, we tried to make out of each day, each what we call a theater day, a model day. It's clear that there can't be any human difference between what's called actor and what's called audience. 
we're all the same thing in that way. But there is a difference because the audience can't be prepared. That's what makes it an audience. It has just assembled. The actors, on the other hand, are different in the sense that they prepare for the event. And this tiny difference is also a gigantic one. Everything really comes from what makes this difference right and what makes it possible for this difference gradually to change. And so in the first place, the actor comes to an audience to give something. But for the actor to be able to give something, he needs to prepare what he can give. And this preparation is a very long process. One of the sides of the preparations is a tuning, like a tuning of an instrument that goes on over a long time because there are many different strings to tune in different ways. This morning, a working day is beginning with a long way to go. And before going into any other area, we'll continue quietly going through a preparation that focuses on the very simple elements that eventually need to come into play in a more complicated form. An exercise has got perhaps a general description, but it only becomes real between the people who are doing it. The leader of a group gives an exercise in a certain way to those people that particular day in those circumstances. And it can't be imitated. If it imitates, it's just taking the outer form of it, the top of the iceberg, and not the main part that's under the water. And what we wanted to bring out by the public exercises were not the exercises themselves, but the concentration, discipline, and perseverance that have to go into an exercise and which do help other workers, other students, in seeing that there is a form of discipline without which no new ground can be broken and no new levels of intensity reached. It's always obviously valuable to first thing in the morning to do some physical exercise, get uh, you know some something going between people as well as just to warm up your body. That's the kind of exercise that's deceptively simple. Uh, in fact, to get a sort of group movement going like that is, takes a lot of work and concentration. First, it's as though one person moving, and not however many, 10, 20, 30.
sense of possible development came as we worked together. The more we worked together, the more we shared difficulties. Bruce Myers, from England, who joined uh, the company three years ago. My, the way I work and the things I want to do has been defined very much by other people in the group, by the way they work and the very considerable differences in approach, in what theatre means, the way they work in the theatre, the way they see art, and very much, that's really been the emphasis. The emphasis has been very much on forms of theatre, different forms of making truth. Truth comes from simplicity, from an aware, spontaneous reaction to another actor's invitation or demand. You watch three people walking at different speeds. One of them, suddenly, you find you're, you're believing. You're watching him and he's moving along and you are believing him. What the hell that means, believing him, he's not doing anything, he's just walking. Two other people follow and you're not believing them because they're not really true to their walk. They're thinking of something and their arms swinging according to one set of habits, their legs are stumping because they've got locked in another set of habits and the whole block moving along is totally inexpressive or expresses of a thousand different haphazard things and you are not believing a central intention. The actor who focuses all that at once becomes believable even though there's no anecdote, no story, nothing to justify that. And you're believing something that has no name to it. If one uses that yardstick of why one's own interest is all the time ebbing and flowing, it's perhaps the most powerful line on which one can make discoveries. Not only mental, not only 
we've been trying since we started to get away from the whole notion of doing an exercise for the good of developing a muscle, developing a voice. And we've tried to find what expresses itself always in a form that has a strong feeling. And we found that we're moving the body for its own sake rapidly falls into some form of gymnastics by making the movements that are guided by the stick. One is making something very beautiful, that the sticks floating through space are so beautiful in their own right that it tranquilizes the ego. The ego drops into the background, the whole sense that the theater is a place for assertive self-expression, which is complete, say, false, disappears, and in its place becomes a human body serving with pleasure the beauty of movements making silent geometry in space. And there is such a strong feeling to evoke that the actual gymnastics, putting the body into a state of alertness, happens by itself, while the ritual, and in a sense this is our ritual, is making something that needs great attention and great quietness altogether for the deep satisfaction that that brings. It's a satisfaction in coming together in a natural and communal act that is a form of celebration because making something beautiful that then disappears is a celebration. Liz Suedos, and originally from Buffalo, New York. What we're trying to get to is, is the same kind of state, the same kind of fire. Um, honesty that you hear in music in, in any country where the music is a absolutely um, a complete part of the whole way of life, of the whole way of ritual. I joined the group because I was beginning to see and studying, composing and working in music that the only way for music to be alive now was so much quantity of um, things being written and things being done, the only way to really have it be truthful and, and alive was with theater. And Peter seemed to be going in that direction with languages and sound.
kind of work with listening, with really finding how to make sounds that are truly from inside of you, with not only doing that personally, but trying as a group to make something that has development, that builds as a piece of music and yet isn't written down, um, is something that takes probably a lifetime. Having worked intensely for a year, the group is becoming much more sensitive and much more in tune with itself. has its own precision. Perhaps we could attempt one or two things so simple that it gives us something to look at together. carefully to what is being made in this room, one can see that there are two completely opposite ways of seeing. One of them is the attempt consciously to make a personal sound, a sound that is each person's form of expression. The other is, here is something that belongs to no one, and it's as strong and pure a sound as I can make and the others can make together. Now, the more completely that sound can be made, the more one finds a meaning arising. And these are the big differences, whether the sound puts a meaning into itself, whether the sound is a vehicle for letting personal feelings pour out, or whether, in a way, in trying to say this is nothing to do with me, I'm going to do something completely impersonal. I am just going to make that particular sound like a line going out into space. The discovery can be made that, of course, in trying to make it nothing but a line going into space, something more deeply personal, but of a quite different sort, comes into it that only arises if all the thinking suddenly goes in a shared direction, not making two sounds, three sounds, but making just the one sound that's like making one line, and then finding what actually is discovered by the energy that makes.
about half an hour ago. <laughs> and you come back, they're going to lose interest. You have to, and, and not only that, but these sounds that you give must be alive so that they want to keep doing it. You know? It's like if they start running down when you're over there, you have to wind them back up again. You also have to have such a clear idea in a way. You can hear everything. Like you were getting very muddled there. It was getting very noisy. Try much simpler. Just much simpler. And make sure that you're in touch with everybody, okay? In this, one can catch the whole mystery of what theatre time is, because theatre time is different. One knows that something happening, surrounded by a group of people watching, suddenly is in a different time scale to the time of everyday life. It doesn't mean that everything has to go fast. There are other ways of recognizing it which come down to intense slowness. And in between that very, very fast tempo and that very slow tempo, there is a time that lives and dies. In this very simple exercise, there are two people who can come to exactly the same point. The one person who is doing the conductor and the other, which is any person in the group, who is actually making the sound, a moment where it's interesting for him, where he wakes up and he responds. Now that has a life, and this can be watched. It's born, it lives, and it begins to die. The mystery of what refreshes, what brings the life back, Again, is a mystery that's touched directly both by the person doing the giving of the orders and the person receiving the orders. There comes a moment when the conductor gives a sound that is exactly the sound that you wanted to make. When that happens, then one touches the living process. It's not easy, but it can be approached if one keeps the working conditions incredibly simple. We're trying to make sounds that you can go anywhere. Uh, you can meet with any people, and they will, they will hear the sounds. They will hear the music, and it will strike something in them. It won't be an old melody that they uh, recognize. It won't be a, a, a rhythm that they were brought up on. But there's something in the energy, in the belief in what we're doing, which will strike. Yeah! <laughs> 
the essence of the theatre form is objectively chemical. The presence of other people is the fire that brings the latent experience to the boil. And this is what participation is always about. Participation can take the form of the audience standing, it can take the form of the audience joining in, but those are just forms. The essence is that there is a meeting of prepared and unprepared elements, and through the density of the human material, all focusing and concentrating on one spot, that something comes about in a way that can't happen if there are less people there. There's the sort of emotion that appears between two people in a realistic situation, and there's a very different sort of feeling that can spread through a group of people when everybody is doing a certain hand movement at the same time. And the beauty of that is, is very emotional, and something that for us has been more interesting than cultivating the emotion that the expression of personal problems and personal situations. Would somebody like to make the experiment that we were attempting at the beginning of the morning, which is to see whether it's possible to find the same lightness and freedom just in walking. Try quite deliberately to change the speed of walking, trying to immediately make it totally meaningful, so that no part of you is left out. It isn't just meaningful for one part that moves faster and another drags behind. And that's where the problem begins to lie, because the head, the shoulders, the hips are all moving at, all tend to move at different paces. Trying to do nothing unnatural, purely and simply moving slower or faster. It's not a matter of feeling relaxed. It's a matter of a sort of tuning of yourself so that when you decide, now, I will change tempo and move faster, you're completely alive and true to this new speed. Just from that, knife edge, one touches the question of what deliberate acting stems from. Everybody's way of walking, for instance, is deeply drenched with his personality. And one has a real choice. Is one going to develop those mannerisms, or is one trying to Start from the point where everything, fingertips, toes, stomach, hips, drop one set of habits and pick up whatever the moment demands. Now here, it demands going a shade faster. Can everything regroup itself and make a brand new individual? And the difference is that he is perfectly complete, but he is a shade faster in every way. Is it possible to find that without all the structures that come from memory, ideas, wish to portray? Is it possible, first of all, before going into any of those areas, just to go quite directly into it? Raise this, there's a great question. 
there are many connected with it, and I'm sure that everyone here has got many personal observations and experiences that we can share, but I think later in the day, when we've done a little more work together, it'll be more fruitful for all of us, particularly as it's lunchtime now. I thought of starting this afternoon with travel dance. First of all, to reanimate everyone picking up from where we left off, but not with the group doing it alone. On the contrary, immediately doing it with many people, yes, immediately doing it with as many people as we can, watching one another, so that the idea is there, and so that you can pick it up at the end of the performance as something like calling. These are things that have already happened during the day. There are one or two extremely simple conditions. As a line, you try to find the beginning of a movement, which must be very tiny, without a leader. The line has to take the time to get in tune. Gradually, you try to let the movement come into being, and if possible, you try to find one movement together. Accept your vision as it is. You, you can see out of the corner of your eyes, you can feel. Accept that without giving yourself the anxiety of looking round. It is how it is. It will be exactly how it develops. The whole interest of the group is to try to be ready either to give a lead or to take it. So if three people give leads, two give way to the third and there can't be a rule. The lead will come from somewhere. Just a moment, just a moment, I think there's something that isn't quite clear. When I said there's no leader, that means there's no fixed leader. But at any given moment, anybody for a second becomes leader if the readiness is there. So that, for instance, you're just doing a movement like this, and then at a certain point, one person does that. Why he does it, nobody will ever know. We can never go backwards on it, but it's obviously right. And everybody else, out of the corners of their eye, are so ready for the next step that when suddenly it happens like that, everybody's with it. Now, in that way, it is possible for the impulse to be slowly gathering, slowly gathering, and then be led here, and then it's led there, and then it's led there, and then it comes to here and then it's led again. Sometimes everybody finds something together, sometimes it comes from more one person than another. things are tied together. The, the more the, the, the small quiet portion finds a real unity, the more the opening out can also find 
something that seems completely free, and yet in which a total unit is preserved. Now, since the greatest strength in an exercise is if it's quite clear when the exercise isn't. It's very hard, and perhaps it's even usually very blocking and sometimes destructive to know in advance what it should be. That put, sets up something that's almost impossible to meet. It becomes true as each person within it begins to come into a more and more full and deep agreement, then an extraordinarily strong life is ready to shoot through and guide all these forms. But the line, to go back to what we are talking about this morning about tuning, the line is exactly like strings which make a good or bad sound. Good or bad there is very clear. They make a good or bad sound depending on just how they are tuned to one another. And as that isn't something that can be done with pegs and hands, it can only be done at the moment when it's taking place each person in his own way by working from the image that he has of what, is, what it means to be more or less in tune. Let's take the, just the little fragment of elements that we've been dealing with so far today and Let's speak about them from any point of view anyone would like. Mr. Burke, would you say something about the relationship of the exercise to the performance? In what way? This is the place where mm -hmm. there's usually that chasm, at least yes. for me, a gap. To cover all that's needed in a performance will cover more than the widest span of exercise could ever cover. And any exercise just develops one point. An actor, when he goes into performance, is really doing something so amazing. The word act is a tremendous word, because very few people are capable of acting in any circumstances in life whatsoever. And yet the one human activity that is labeled acting is not a spurious thing. It carries with it this fantastically pretentious claim that for a brief period, someone is actually there in front of the people fulfilling the highest demands on himself and therefore justifying a form that is a reflection of life because it is life taking out of its mm, vagueness and softness and bewildering confusion and sharpened. You're dealing with elements that will only exist one time. The actual elements that are in this moment will never be repeated. So that two people doing, oh, one holding up his hand and the other responding, for that to be really natural and living has countless things in it that will never be repeated again. To be true means being true to this moment. Some of us were talking actually about at lunchtime the most perfect image of improvisation in that respect is somebody on a tightrope. Because what he is actually doing moment for moment couldn't be predicted nor repeated. It is, even if he went straight back on that tightrope and walked over it again, these countless adaptations really belong to that moment. Basically the human organism and what's around it. Objects, people and then eventually social relationships. Those have to be constantly refreshed in the moment because if they're not fresh in the moment they never will be on a bigger scale. You said that every moment is different and this moment will never occur at any time and that's obviously true. And so in a sense every moment is new. And you've also been talking about making the habitual new. Making what? Making the habitual new. Yeah. Um, 
what, I, what I'm asking is how you get from the desire to make the habitual new to discovering the actual newness that there is in every moment, other than through willing it or desiring it. There's the condition in which things happen by themselves, for which nobody can take any credit. Something happens, but nobody has actually brought it about in his own right. Now, the opposite end of that is if you take something without any sort of preparation whatsoever, that's the essential thing, that you go straight into an action, and you know that you haven't got till two in the morning and the band and liquor, you have just got five and a half seconds, and you're sitting like this, and you know that the end of your action is to have your hand up like that. Now, can you, without the support of character, situation, pretending that you are involved in this, all of which will help you to find that movement, can you, just like that, make that movement with conviction. If you can make it with conviction, it becomes, in a sense, mesmeric. But everybody watching who lives the whole movement with you and therefore enters into its full meaning. Only one real difficulty, and that's the terrible one. And that is the difficulty not to be sidetracked from trying to cultivate something truthful. And that almost all the time, something is sidetracking that possibility. The moment an improvisation begins to take off and things begin to happen, you're again, you're in this, for a director, that's where you're in the terrible position. Do you stop it because it's beginning to go well? If you stop it when nothing's happened, if you stop it often enough when nothing has happened, then you'll prevent anything happening because everybody begins to agree that nothing's going to happen and that in the end you convince them that nothing's going to happen. So when something begins to live, are you going to bang that on the head or chop it off. But at the, at the same time, the, the moment that's happened already, it contains in it the possibility of going off there, there, there. And amongst all those, there's only that one rare moment when it actually links to the next really growing possibility. So that that's really where the agony comes in. I should say is the, the real danger is finding the place to stop. Not too soon and not too late. <laughs> I don't know, I had huge expectations before I joined the group of a complete change in myself and in my act and in my attitudes. With changes that large, they're not something you can pin down. I feel a change has occurred, but it's not something that I can put my finger on. You don't dis like discover new things like that. It's lots of eureka. That's something I've learned. I thought that it would be eureka when I first came. But theatrical research, which is absolutely what it's been for a year, just an experimentation, failure, experimentation, success, experimentation, failure, 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 success, failure. You don't find things which you can hold on to. It's a very, very gradual and slow process. And the things that you find are elusive, but nonetheless there. I think it can be pursued individually alone, with a great deal of strength. I mean the work just in oneself, because a lot of our work has been individual work on yourself. That work can be pursued with a lot of strength. I think the work as a group, the theatrical research, can't be pursued without Peter and without the existence of the group. I believe it would have been a very risky thing if instead of coming to this group a year ago, I'd done a television series. 
that would have been incredibly risky for the rest of my life. It would have put the rest of my life in jeopardy. The great challenge is to do the right thing at the right time, in every way. And it's very difficult to, to find usually either one thing or the other thing is slightly off balance. And occasionally the two come together. in the theatre it is possible to be awakened and illuminated to the point when one is sharing in a heightened state of awareness which one can't reach alone and in ordinary conditions. When it's sound, because it is intense, unmistakable, and at the same time carries no recognizable shape, of course it's common to everyone. that actually gives a nourishment, it gives a food of a sort you can't find, provides a sole food that can only be got there. So it gives theatre people the possibility of knowing that they don't have to go with society in the sense of introducing more poison into the bloodstream if there's poison outside, but they can make small oases in which something that is desperately needed and is not being found elsewhere can arise. 